but delayed. And the delay, time delay, delay of communication between neurons ranges from two milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. So the brain has a structure consists of highly interconnected uh, neurons across the entire brain. And uh, the dynamics uh, entails the neural interactions, this interaction, which leads to activities which can be measured experimentally. For example, the, the membrane, uh, the potential difference in the, uh, on the electrodes that are placed on the scalp of the um, head or directly implanted electrode inside the brain. And brain functions are a result of synchronized activity or the coordinated activity between multiple regions of the brain. I have here on the left side, this was taken from, um, I adapted it from a documentary about Professor um, Marion Diamond at Berkeley. Um, and if you look at this, it's, this is the, so the scalp and goes slice by slice to accentuate. I have this nerve impulse running through the maximum fibers. So, it is not a, this, the electrical impulses running through all those axonal fibers, unlike the electricity uh, traveling through um, the wire, this is active transmission. What I mean by that is this is um, the whole wire, the axonal fibers participate actively in transmitting and it takes time going from one region of the brain to another region. That's where the delay comes in. And the, um, this connections of the brain can be measured by diffusion MRI techniques, which is on this here in the right side, which is the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere interconnection, as measured by diffusion tensor imaging, uh, which is based on the water diffusion um, um, asymmetric water diffusion through the brain. I can see the pool now. I don't know, do I have to do anything? I'll just close it. Okay. Um, so, so that's, that's the um, preview here. And I, I have sort of three questions to, I'm oh, sorry. I have sort of three questions to, for the overview. So what are the effects of time delay interaction and synchronization and network oscillation? So how does the, uh, this um, delay in communications of the signal propagation from one region of the brain to another region, one neural population to another neural populations can affect the overall dynamics of the synchronization properties, uh, the network oscillations. And uh, we deal with this on uh, this question, we answer these questions from theory by simulating neuronal models and phase oscillator models. And I will talk about those. And we observe the effect, uh, for example, uh, enhancement in synchrony, coherent, incoherent patterns. I'll talk about that. And um, there are methods from experiment, uh, the experimental time series, there are methods which can be used to infer delayed interactions from experimental recordings. So, and we pioneered one of the method, this intrinsic causality method in the past, and people have been using this method um, all over the world for uh, brain research and looking at, uh, trying to look at these um, interactions between different parts of the brain in, um, in efforts to understand how the brain works or where it doesn't work in case of brain disorders. And the third question one can ask is how are these delayed interactions helpful for understanding brain functions and dysfunctions? Here is, I'll present some examples of experiments, particularly decision making experiments and um, human epilepsy, epileptic seizures from disorder. So the first, what, where, uh, where does the delay come at a, a physical basis of neuronal time delays and oscillations in the brain? I'll briefly talk about that. This comes, um, I have here from college physics. Um, this is from first year college physics. Um, uh, about the delay. Um, so 
there is the schematic of um, a neuron. So neuron has input side and the output side. The input side is called the dendrites and the cell body. And this ax axons, the ions of the current travels, uh, ions travel along the axons to transmit information to the next neurons, postsynaptic neurons, at the axon terminal. So the input comes in, dendrite receives input. When the input crosses the threshold, then this neuron fires activities nonlinearly and travels along the axons and um, travels to the end of the neuron. And depending on the size of this axons, axon, this is axon, this uh, pathway or the, um, this wire, um, depending on the diameter and the, path, uh, the length of this axons, the delay, uh, delay would depend on the diameter and the axons. So this is what happens. Uh, the, each uh, neuron rest, there are 96 billion of neurons in the brain. So neuron rests, uh, sorry, neuron rests at negative potentials. Um, inside is negative 70 volts compared to millivolts compared to outside. Um, and because um, outside uh, there are ions, positive ions, more ions, for example, sodium ions is more outside in the external medium than inside concentration of that and sodium ions is more inside. So when the new, when neuron receives input from other neurons, um, then this can change, the potential inside can change um, because of the opening of the sodium channel. Sodium channel opens, um, channel, the gate opens and the sodium ions enter into the cell. That increases the concentration of the ion, which leads to higher um, potential uh, difference inside to outside of the cell. And then when it reaches the threshold that the sodium channel closes and the potassium channel opens, the potassium channels um, leaves the cell now um, and, and the inside potential is starting to decrease again. And it's, um, there's a phase, is this I call the polarization, depolarization, repolarization phases. And this, um, but the potassium channel um, gets, you know, stays open for a little bit longer, so it goes beyond negative 70 millivolts. So that happens at the soma, right? And then it restores the potential through the ionic pumps, sorry, ionic pump mechanism, which utilizes energy. Um, and, and, but so that happens at the cell body. Now the cell body uh, and the axon consists of number of gaps between inside and outside of the cell membrane of the axon membranes and um, insulated by this uh, myelin sheath. You see, you see, see the gap, uh, you see, see the, here, the gap. And the, so when the cell body fires the axon potential, this is axon potential here, it changes uh, drastically. Um, Cotton travels along the axons one node, these are node gaps, one gaps to another gap. And it acts like, and the next gap, and next gap, and so on. It acts like a charging and discharging of a capacitor. And in fact, the model, the original model, the wind and the Nobel Prize winning model of 1952 by Hoskin Huxley was built on this idea of the cell as uh, modeled by the RC, um, charging and discharging at the capacity of the circuit. So, um, so there is a series of circuits. The first one closes, charges fully, that reaches the threshold, and then it moves along. So it hops from one to, um, one to another node, and there the delay comes in. And if we look at the propagation of this along the axons, it looks like this, um, like a wave of propagation along the axons. And, um, and this eats, um, this depends on the um, time constant of um, this conduction, um, the capacitor's, um, capacitance properties. And it's about 40 microseconds um, eats uh, roughly the time constant of our neurons in the brain. It depends on the types of the neuron, but that's roughly. And there are hundreds of um, those nodes. That leads to substantial delay 
going from you know a few milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds. And um, uh, the dependence of this conduction speed, which um, you know the uh, sorry, this goes back. The, uh, so the myelinated. So if there is a myelin seat, the insulations then the conduction speed is proportional to the diameter. If it's not myelinated, then it's, it, um, it's not linear. It's non-linear, it's more like a, a, root, a square root of the uh, diameter. So, but this, um, this property of the myelination, myelination changes over the growth, right? So neurodevelopment, the tile grows and it becomes adult, the myelination becomes mature. And as you grow older, this myelination decays. And in, in case of disorders, the myelination uh, goes down. And that leads to changes in delay. So there's a study of the effect of delay, looking at the delay and the activities. Um, it's very hard of understanding how the brain works through different phases. And then also, uh, just to give you a flavor of the experimental estimates of um, this, um, this thing, um, experimental delay, uh, um, estimates of delays. So again, this is a DTI, uh, diffusion tensor imaging method, looking at the water diffusion can give you, can give you the idea of the fiber tracks, the wide axonal tracks, bundle of axonal tracks. Uh, okay. Um, Hello. Uh, Sorry. Uh, yes. This is Raju. Kose uh, kose le sound ma ali clear ba ena ba niran ba cha ena. Maybe tapay ali room ma pasadi ya agadi laptop ko ali kati close gare ba ne farak par sakhi. It's a desktop. Can you hear me okay now? Uh, or, uh, yeah, yeah I can hear you. Uh, okay, ठीक छ उइ होइन मैले भनेको त्यहाँ पोसिबल हुन्छ भने ठाउँ एडजस्ट गरौ नत्र भने इट्स ओके र मे आई फ्रॉम द कम्प्युटर आई एम आई यूज डेस्कटप आई थॉट ओके हुन्छ उसो भए हामी पार्टिसिपेन्ट लाई साउन्ड आफ्नो साउन्ड अलिकति ठूलो पारौ अहिले ठीक छ ओके सरी टु इन्टरप्ट प्लीज गो अहेड नो प्रब्लम एन्ड आई जस्ट जस्ट टु गिभ यू द फ्लेवर अफ द कन्डक्शन डिलेस it can range from anywhere it's measured in animals animals of course animals can be sacrificed afterwards and um, um, stimulation techniques um, it, it will stimulate the nerve and look at the other end of it and how long it takes to reach that end you can measure the delay that's how uh, it was measured in animals and it goes from anywhere from few seconds to 40 milliseconds between the brain region and the corpus callosum. This is the corpus callosum, which, is, uh, which connects the interhemisphere, two hemispheres of the brain. Um, it's, it's at the middle, of the middle of the brain. And here is the frontal part of the brain connected to the corpus callosum. And this, these are the estimates from humans. Um, some are humans, um, the dead um, cadaver's brain. And the mean delays, those um, reasons, uh, frontal, parietal, visual reasons are about eight milliseconds or so. So it's roughly ranges from, um, and if you look at uh, one part of the brain to the other, um, uh, for example, the motor cortex to prefrontal cortex and so on, it can substantially range. And again, I, I told you about this, that the conduction delay can change with neurodegenerative disease. Um, like multiple sclerosis, ALS, neurodevelopment because of the myelination change. Even during normal aging, when you get older, this delay can change. And, which is, um, and neuroplasticity, when you learn um, a skill, they acquire a skill that can change also. And during mental illnesses, the delay can change. And here, yeah, just to give you a flavor of uh, what um, other people have used the delay um, estimates. In computational modeling, looking at the brain, um, modeling of brain activity, this study, for example, published in 2008, used a delay <clears throat> going from 2.7 to 26.7, which was um, extrapolated from or used from COCOMAC or uh, monkey data sets um, measured from monkeys and used the speed six meter per second average speed. Um, 
measure the use distance and divide by the speed, average speed. So it's a kind of circular highly estimate delay. Um, you know, the um, speed can change also depending on the diameter. And this were the second study that, um, again, theoretical study, but they use experimental data there, or DTI data, um, looking at the interhemisphere and in, uh, interhemispheric um, delays, which are almost double, more than double inter interhemispheric delays. And this, um, uh, in neural field modeling um, approach also, um, this extrapolated delay from animal studies, they have used 80 milliseconds for corticothalamic delay. That is a center in the brain which acts as a gateway that's known as thalamus. For example, that visual stimuli, you see something, it goes through retina and uh, thalamus um, and the brain, and this thalamus to the brain, the main cortex, has a delay. Right? So one way is more than the other way. So, and the total loop delay is 80 milliseconds. And it is believed that this, um, um, the frequency of oscillation that you observe in um, brain recordings, for example, electroencephalographic recordings, which I'm showing here, this um, electro scalp electrodes, the uh, net of the electrodes, the person is wearing that, and uh, you look at the activities, the potential difference of this electrode with respect, with respect to a reference that could be uh, electrode in the middle or in the ear lobe. In this case, probably it was um, ear lobe reference. That's the potential changes. And the person has their eyes closed. During eyes closed um, uh, condition, they have their 10 hertz oscillations highlighted, um, uh, dominant 10 hertz oscillations there. So you can see the 10 cycles per second oscillations there in the time series. And this cycle oscillation is believed to be contributed by its circuit delay, although it depends on the intrinsic properties of neurons. So in different, different factor intrinsic properties, uh, extracellular mediums, what ionic conditions are there in the, in the brain. And also it depends on what parts of the brain is uh, interacting with other, other parts. So thalamocortical um, interaction leads to believed to lead to this um, 10 hertz oscillations. And if we look at the overall um, oscillatory feature, the spectra from recording, this, these, are the, these are recordings from humans, ease, um, epilepsy patients, which you can see 10 hertz oscillation peak there, but this, there is a range of oscillations. Uh, um, sorry, this keeps going back. Um, there is a name for the traditional oscillation peak Delta, way which you can observe in during sleep, a theta during memory processes, alpha during relaxed eyes closed conditions, beta motor activities, and this gamma 30 to 90 hertz during thought processes, and um, and high frequency activity during the epileptic seizure, more than 90 hertz oscillations are recorded from inside the brain. Historically. This was, um, you know, Norbert Wiener, as you may have heard about uh, his name. He was interested in the brain and also a physicist, a mathematician. He drew this sketch um, of 10 hertz oscillations. He had this 10 hertz oscillation peak. Brain, uh, this um, 10 hertz oscillation was discovered in 1924. So he was trying to explain that. So he drew this sketch and um, said that they are like oscillators coupled together. And there are slow, uh, slow group, faster group, and there's one in the middle, it's highly synchronized. And later on, 1972, this model was discovered to, uh, to describe the collective, um, collective, oscill collective behaviors of um, oscillators, um, oscillations. And this is called the um, phase oscillator model, chromatomodel. model. Chromatomodel model in 19, so discovered, uh, invented in 1972, which is used to study synchronizations in many fields, actually. This is, bi uh, this is used in biology, neuroscience, physics, chemistry, to understand the collective behaviors of oscillators. So here is, uh, this is phase. Phase um, and this is intrinsic frequency of each oscillators, and this is the coupling term. 
that's a, um, for example, kth neuron, kth oscillator is uh, coupled to jth oscillators in terms of number of, um, in the number of oscillators in the thermodynamic limit, one can observe this behavior. If the scale is, which is called the coupling constant, you increase the coupling constant, then you start to see they cluster together. They start to oscillate, and uh, you can see this behavior oscillator unit, uh, going on around a unit, um, unit circle. Unit circle, um, they are dispersed first. They are not coupled, right? So when you start to couple them, they cluster together. There is a faster group, there is a group in the middle, there is a slower group, and they cluster together. And this phase coherence uh, increases. So depending on K, you can uh, couple them, you can synchronize them, and different kinds of behavior emerge as a result of coupling. Now we have asked questions in this model also later, and I'll talk about that. What happens when we have delay, the time delay of interactions? This, this assumes here, this model assumes instantaneous uh, interactions. So I'm, I'm gonna get to the theory, I, I talked too much about the introduction. So, uh, the first question is that what are the effects of delay? Um, so how do you model the delay? So delay can come in, like I said, delay can come in the axonal propagations of um, activities. This is neuron two, neuron one. Neuron two sends the activities or axonal potential to neuron one. So along the axons, it takes time to, uh, for one to see once this uh, first neuron to see the second activity of second, and there could be act, um, you know delay at the synaptic uh, at the terminal of uh, the contact and um, near the contact, and that's called the synaptic delay. But that delay is small compared to the axon delay, and there are two types of coupling. One is the electrical coupling. Electrical coupling says you know the second neuron. For example, first is coupled, second one coupled to first, to second, um, first we'll see the second effect of the second instantaneously. Um, uh, 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 sorry, uh, with the delay uh, at time t, uh, delay t here, as a result of potential difference, for example, the axis represent here potential difference. In the other type of coupling, this first neuron sees the difference of second when it crosses the activity of second crosses a threshold. So it's a threshold type of coupling there, heavy side type of coupling. Sometimes it, it was it's represented by gamma oscillation. This is called the chemical um, coupling, and this is called the first one is electrical coupling. So there are both type of couplings present in the brain, more chemical coupling than the electrical coupling. Um, so the delay can range from um, anywhere from this keeps moving 100 to um, 200 milliseconds. And how do you model uh, delay? You can put all, everything in the coupling term. So when you have delay, there's a delay differential equation, nonlinear equation of nerve cells, uh, collection of nerve cells, couple cells, becomes infinitely um, delay differential equations, and which you can solve. And discretizing it um, becomes also mathematically challenging. Um, and then there are the nerve cells. How do you model nerve cells? There are um, different models. So this is the hodgkin Huxley models, which are realistic uh, neurons. There are other phenomenological type of models also. And this paper in 2004 compares um, computational properties of uh, neurons. This, we have used Hinmarstrow's neuron models which mimics the neural behaviors of a single neurons, but um, um, real neuron, but it doesn't have real time, um, real neuron time scales. It's computationally very efficient. And uh, we have used that and, um, so we have used that in our um, simulations. So which can show spiking behavior, accent potential, and also burst type of behavior. And here, the Hoskin Huxley type of mo model was derived from, again, RC um, charging and discharging of this membrane uh, membranes of uh, cell and current, different currents flowing through ions. Um, so, Hinmarstrow's neural model consists of three models 
x, y, and z variable, x, y, and fast variable, z is adapt called the adaptation variable, slow variable. And when this, uh, so it is a uh, question of its motions are defined by this x, y, z variables. When this neuron, let's say one neuron receives the input, this i is the external input, then it start to uh, spike. So it spikes our behavior, oscillate on its own. So its i value is at somewhere, let's say uh, 2.31 or 3 point something here, then it can show bursting behavior, which we have probed here going through this, uh, looking at the maximum values, extremum value. You can um, you know, change from high to low. You can go through periodic behavior, nonlinear behavior, periodic nonlinear behavior, the period doubling cascade to chaotic behavior, and then again, periodic behavior. So in the chaotic behavior, which um, you know, entails the um, sensitivity to initial conditions, that means if you start the system from two uh, close by initial conditions and let it go, then those conditions lead to different outcomes, different trajectories. Um, that's, uh, that can be defined by the exponent, the rate of uh, divergence of trajectories uh, exponent, uh, what's called the lifetime of exponent. If it's positive, then you have chaos. So there is a chaotic regime. So it's have been printed in um, many periodic orbits. So it has a bursting phase, and I, I want to focus here on uh, two time scales. It has a fast spike time scale, right? So in the slow time scale, which you can um, easily see in this phase space portrait. Um, if you plot x, y, and z all together, you see it's plot like this, and I'm plotting here a portion of it do the red dots here, this is a slow, and then it gets into fast rhythm there. And um, uh, talking about synchronously you couple two, for example, to start with, and you see that you increase this coupling strength epsilon here, um, i neuron is coupled to j neuron, then it's, you start to see the change in behavior. There are uh, identical neurons, but chaotic neurons, Chaotically behaving the run depends on initial condition where they started. And when they start to couple them together, they, um, they start to uh, have a synchronized output. And you can check the stability of synchronization. Um, the output of one correlated with another one, highly correlated when they are synchronized. And you can check their um, stability of synchronized states. Right? Um, and if you start from the initial condition somewhere else, uh, if that synchronized state leads to this manifold and this uh, synchronized state is stable, you can do stability analysis, which we call this transverse dynamic solving, this transverse dynamics. Transverse uh, dynamics, you can infer the stability of synchronization. So here, so this, again, this rate of divergence of, um, initial uh, trajectories from the different initial conditions. If it's positive, this is not stable. If it's negative, this is the highest life of exponent of the system. So there are two um, uh, oscillators here, blue and um, represented in blue and green output, membrane potential, and they are unsynchronized. When you couple them with strong ring, they are synchronized. So uh, we observe this and uh, we observe also in this paper that I reported in 2004, there are two time scales of oscillations and they synchronize at different points. Um, and, but when you uh, start to couple them with a delay, so the electrical coupling here, couple them with a delay, so the, again, uh, the logic of the delay, there's a local, if there is a population of neuron locally, delay can be negligible, but if they are far apart, the communication between two groups of neurons we cannot ignore the delay in comparison, comparable to the oscillate time period of oscillations. So you have to model that. So that's why it enters into the model. So you have, when you have, for example, take the same model, so two neuron model. When you have no delay at point one coupling strengths, which was somewhere here, they were unsynchronized. They're not synchronized. When you start at the same coupling strength, when you have a delay, a delay, for example, is a delay, 
and the system, they are synchronized, completely synchronized, overlapped, um, you know, blue and uh, green um, activity there, the bursting activity. And you can represent from the Lapinov exponent plot, positive and negative, again, positive um, unstables, negative is stable here. And there is a stable state, a stable region at low value of coupling that the time delay leads to. So we, in this paper, we, can, um, we concluded that, um, we reported that this, there is a in sort of delay induced uh, synchrony or enhancement of synchrony. And this has been shown in other models and extended to realistic models also this, um, this our work. And, and now going back to that with positive coupling and uh, negative couplings, uh, we want to understand negative synaptic coupling. What happens to when you have delay? When you, ha when you have a negative coupling, it's hard to synchronize without delay. But when you have, when you add delay in the system, system goes through, so here we have, um, especially distributed neurons, a model with, um, for example, 100 neurons, uh, 1,000 connections, and different coupling strengths. These represent represented here as a coupling strength and um, non-identical neurons. They are not identical. When they are not, there is a space representation here, and there is a time um, of the plots, the projection of that the activity. And um, it shows this um, unordered activities. There is no some. Uh, there is no order there. But when you start to put delay, increase the delay here for eight, fifteen, twenty, it goes to a different periodic sort of periodic um, stage. So the mean field is represented by x. Um, it's constant, whereas uh, with the uh, delay, some substantial delay. As you, you could observe uh, the periodic, so different periodic states. And uh, you can quantify that first or find out the boundary of the um, this stable um, state, of the critical delay. So that we found out in this work that even with a negative delay, which is hard to, uh, with a negative delay, it's hard to synchronize the system, that there is a critical delay um, that can uh, induce synchronization um, in, uh, in case of couple oscillators. So, and this uh, critical coupling strength sort of depends on, sorry, I'm going back and forth, uh, depends on, um, it's a roughly inversely proportional to the critical delay. So that is a boundary and that's what um, we inferred here. Um, and recently in 2018, we, um, did some work, two papers, published two papers using this coromotor phase oscillators um, in trying to understand the effects of delay further. What happens when you have delay in, in different types of coupling? In, we had studied before and nobody had that, this problem when you have positive and negative coupling. So the brain has both, um, again, the relevance to the brain. Uh, brain has both positive and negative couplings, that excitatory and inhibitory couplings, excitation and inhibition. And we wanted to ask your questions, what happens when you have both coupling, type of coupling, and what can delay do? Um, and um, what type of transitions it leads to in case of delay? So this, um, in this work, we have done um, exact, uh, calculated exact analytical results for the boundaries of uh, stability boundaries. And again, the coromotor models, is, um, you know, um, with a non-delay coromotor model, consist of this uh, variable, the phase, um, the rate of change of phase, um, equal to the intrinsic frequency plus the coupling term here, the coupling strength k, and the coupling term sinusoidal term, which makes it nonlinear. When k is a small, if it's positive, sorry, um, k is a small. They are uh, the oscillators in the unit phase circles are dispersed, and you can measure by the uh, measure by the phase coherence defined as such here. Phase coherence R mean uh, mean coherence and uh, phase coherence and uh, mean phases are there. And uh, when 
when they're um, sort of clustered together, R is high. They are dispersed, R is low. Phase coherence is low. And there can be two types of transition depending on the coupling strain type of distributions in this intrinsic frequency. They have, this has been studied a lot um, in different contexts and different fields, biology, chemistry, <laughs> physics, and so on. You can see that the Modern Physics Review or Modern Physics published many papers on this. Um, so it could lead to continuous type of transitions. So there is a continuous type of transitions or uh, uh, in terms of when you have a number of oscillators in uh, thermodynamic limits and going to infinity, large number of uh, uh, particles. And also it can lead to uh, abrupt type of transition. So there are two types of transitions. So it mimics the behaviors of, you know, thermal phase transitions uh, are, um, uh, you know, phase transition we, we often study in the traditional physics, first order and second order kind. Here the second order and first order type. So um, in this, um, we constructed these models and models is, um, maybe I should explain from the figure here. We have two types of um, oscillators, positive uh, populations and negative populations uh, represented here in red and the blue. Um, so the negative positive population that the positive oscillator sends, positive group sends positive influence to other. Um, negative oscillator sends a negative influence. That's what is um, um, represented with this equation for his oscillator model. So we have a group delay, time delay tau one for the group first one, and the second group with time delay tau two for this um, to look at the effect. And we studied the, we studied this equation, the behavior of this equation that the oscillators. Um, uh, this is what happens when they are synchronized, considered synchronized and perturbing that synchronized state, whether that uh, returns to the synchronized state or deviates from synchronized states, or um, looking at the incoherent state, starting from incoherent state, stability of incoherent state, both approach. And that leads us to, oh, sorry, I didn't. Um, we are here in this study, we discover um, there is a multi-stable state depending on the parameters, depending on the time delays. Uh, we study the symmetric and asymmetric time delays. And symmetric time delay um, behavior is sort of similar, but the point to note here is uh, that uh, with increasing delay compared to uh, the time period of oscillations, this, um, White reason is the stable state. The blue uh, reasons, blue, uh, that's uh, blue, it's green reasons um, is, um, it's multi-stable state, which where incoherent, coherent state can be, um, uh, can be observed both. And this red state is a completely unstable state. Um, incoherent state is stable, but coherent state is unstable, completely unstable. And so uh, you, you, you see similar behavior, but what we observe is that there, there, is, there could be a cluster state and you start number of oscillators and dispersed and finally they return to um, in a synchronized state becomes one cluster and you could observe also quasi-periodic behavior in between. So this was an interesting study. If you um, are interested, you can read about the um, conclusions. Um, and it has some, you know, uh, so it shows the abrupt behavior that the time delay indicates the time delay can induce uh, abrupt uh, type of transitions also. And you see that um, there, here is a, uh, Coupling strength with the delay present, you change the coupling strength the four directions with blue dots represented here. And the backward directions you increase, go from high to low, it doesn't follow the same path. There is a hysteristic effect, a memory effect of oscillators, just like in uh, ferromagnetism. And this was another study that we wanted to study this, the uh, weighted delay, the frequency weighted delay that has also relevance to the brain um, because different parts of the brain have different frequencies and um, maybe the coupling is weighted 
based on the frequency. And what we find, uh, what we find out that um, the delay, only positive delay, uh, not negative delay here in this study. Um, we find out that the forward um, transitions, transition the forward directions can change depending on the delay. So here are two plots side by side here. Um, so out here, so the forward delay, um, this is a delay and critical coupling strength that can change depending on the delay, but whereas the backward directions, the coupling strength remains the same. We're able to solve this exactly. And now we are looking at, now this is um, a work in progress, we're looking at the effect of delay in how does the frequency of oscillation change as a result of delayed um, changes. So this has the relevance in the brain, for example, the neurodevelopment, I, uh, I talked about that. For example, um, uh, in normal aging, the delay changes in mental illnesses or um, neurodegenerative diseases, the delay changes. How does it reflect the change of delay, uh, overall delay to frequency of, in the frequency of oscillations? So we're tackling this um, questions uh, theoretically and trying to relate this to the experimental data. Now the second question is the information that we, uh, we have about the uh, delayed interactions, how can that be useful to understand the brain phenomena uh, from experiments? And there is a method, this method, the uh, Granger causality methods can infer delayed interactions. And uh, in recent work that uh, I'm, uh, we are working on this, but this uh, Granger causality method can be extended to exactly calculate delays also. How much time do I have, uh, Nazi? I just... You have uh, like 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I, I told you about the, the, uh, the oscillations that they observe from brain recordings. For example, electrophysiology um, recorded from, electrophysiological recordings recorded from animals planting electrodes inside the brain or humans, the electrodes in epilepsy patients or uh, the EEG electrodes on the scalp can show this frequency, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma, different, different conditions. So during sleep, delta, theta, during I mean, a rep, in memory processes, alpha, in case of, um, um, in case of um, relaxed state or attention, paying attention to something, and beta oscillations uh, in motor maintenance or motor processes. This keeps moving. Um, and in the gamma thought processes. So, but this recordings, each recordings, you know, especially distributed recordings, can entail, can, um, you know, capture the information about the interaction between uh, the processes. For example, let's say the data is recorded from X, this position X, and another set of data on the time series recorded from Y. So in experiment, we record X and Y. And this is the time series over, uh, you know, let's say uh, potential chains, potential different chains over time. And uh, this could, looking at the relationship between these two variables, X and Y, um, these measurements, one can infer about the delay. And uh, it's, uh, so the brain phenomena are um, highly oscillatory, uh, there is oscillations. So um, the oscillatory features can be looked at from this time series of recordings uh, of the brain activity. Oscillatory features that we, we can look at uh, from individual time series or individual processes that captured in power. So spectral power, for example, where all of you are familiar with this. So you have, uh, you take the Fourier transform of this um, and multiply by its uh, conjugate, um, you get the power. 
that is sort of the amplitude square um, and, and can tell you the energy distributions of the power, energy just sort of energy distribution over, over frequency. And if you have a peak, that means there is a you know, substantial amount of strength of oscillations of that particular frequency. One can look at the interdependence between um, two processes, and that can be done with this spectra, um, cross spectra, a normalized cross spectra that's called the coherence. I'll briefly talk about that. And um, other methods to look at the interactions between these two, directed interactions, that is uh, Granger causality, which can be done in frequency domain frequency by frequency, and I can convert it into time domain. If you, uh, if you integrate over the entire frequency range, then you can get back to time domain. And if you have multiple, not only two, you have a multiple time series, you can look at the uh, patterns of uh, information flow of direct in interactions using grains of causality method. And so we can look at the pairwise uh, conditionals also. So um, all the spectral measures um, can be uh, obtained or estimated from time series by two, two types of two approaches. One is called the parametric approach. The other one is non-parametric approach. Parametric approach involves modeling data. So you acquire data, you model data, you calculate parameters of the model. For example, autoregistic model or state space modeling model. And then you discard data, look, use parameter to calculate power, coherence, and range of causality. And the other type of approach, we'd say you are, you know, this um, um, heat flow to look at the Fourier, develop the to Fourier transform to study heat flow a long time ago, more than 100 years ago. Techniques of Fourier and recent more recent technique, the web-led method, 70s. Um, this method can also be used to look at the power and coherence. And, and recently, not recently, actually 10, more than 10 years ago, we developed this tool extending Fourier and web-led method to calculate grains of causality. So which I will briefly talk about this um, also. So there are parametric and non-parametric approach and a non-parametric approach we extended to calculate uh, grains of causality method. And this, uh, the causal, um, uh, this causality, the, uh, from the causality, right? So for example, you have two processes, an X and Y. Causality from X to Y, X, X has an influence on Y, and Y has an influence on X. So you can add those two together, and there is an instant and delayed in a delayed influence or non-delayed influence, instant and in influence that gives you a total association, total interdependence between processes, and um, and that that comes from the coherence coherence measure. This uh, total interdependence is negative of log of one minus coherence. And again, each of these measures can be integrated over the entire frequency range, depends on the sampling rate and so on. And you can get back to time domain measure. Okay, so here, I don't wanna make it complicated, but so again, this, uh, the grains of causality subset of spectral interdependency measures and fits, fits with the traditional measure that's a um, coherence Measure and the coherence is defined as the cross spectral, it's a square coherence defined as cross spectral square divided and normalized by the um, univariate uh, spectra. And the spectra is defined as the product of this uh, transfer functions and noise covariance. Um, sigma is represented by sigma, H is the transfer functions. And I will explain a little bit later, but the, just the definitions here. Um, I'm sorry. So I, I'll get back to this, but the, there is a the definition of the causality in frequency domain involves the power, um, total power of each process, the process that uh, the causal com comes to, and the intrinsic power. I'll come to that. And uh, who is Granger? Granger was um, the economist 
He received a Nobel Prize in 2003 for uh, um, core integrations, a similar um, technique that is used in our uh, technique used in econo econometrics. And um, that, um, the, but the concept of grains of causality comes from Wiener in 1956, in which uh, uh, from a book um, that he published, The Theory of Predictions. Um, and it says that for two simultaneously measured time series, the first series is causal to the second series if the second series can be predicted better by using the knowledge of the first one. So according to this, um, the idea that you have two processes, X, X and Y, and if, if you are trying to pr uh, predict the behavior of X, future behavior of X, if X can be predicted, future behavior of X can be predicted better by using the knowledge of the Y, knowledge of Y, past behavior of Y, then Y has a causal influence on X. That's the idea. And he was interested in the brain. He mentioned that normal uh, brain activities in, the, in that book, that was in 1956. But uh, um, in, in 1969, um, Granger came up with this formalized definition of Granger causality. For example, you have two time series, X and Y, which have time points, X1, X2, and Xn, and so on, and is nth time, time point. And Y time series Y, similarly, you have many time points. For example, you are trying to predict X, looking at um, influence from Y to X, causal influence from Y to X. So it builds on the prediction model. So Xn, the current value of X, or the future value of X, looking at the, can be predicted by combining the past measurements of X. So past behavior of X can predict the future behavior of X. My past behavior can predict the future behavior, how I behave, right? For example, if somebody else has influence on me, their influence, if we model their influence, maybe my behavior can be predicted better. So the, the second model is capture, captures that. So X model can be predicted better by, you know, in, um, incorporating the behavior of Y time points. And you have error in the uh, models. So there's the first error, so this is slipping. Error in the models is first one, the univariate error EX, EX plus Y, uh, there's a bivariate error. So if this second error, magnitude of the second error is less than the magnitude of the first error, then the second model predicts, predicts the second model, or Y helps to predict better. A second model is better. So, but this can be done by time points by time point prediction based on the past measurements. And it, one can calculate the variance of that spread of that error and compare those spread. And that tells you if the spread of this bivariate error, uh, the variance of bivariate error less than the variance of the univariate error, you have a causal inference from y to x. And, um, and this can be defined, you know, the, uh, the, this quantity behaves well if you take a log um, of the variance univariate error divided by bivariance error. If there is no improvement in this prediction, second predict, uh, prediction model, then this, both of the errors will be the same. The ratio will be one log of that will be zero, right? Um, and, but this, this helps to predict then this bivariate error will be less. So it will be, the ratio will be larger than one and it leads to higher than um, zero value. So you have causal influence. If it helps to predict better, uh, the prediction model becomes better incorporated incorporated in the second time series. You can switch the role of X and Y and predict Y now. You can calculate the causal influence from X to Y. So this is the time domain Granger causality. And on, um, you know, Granger himself could not come up with a frequency domain measure, but Quickie um, in 1982 came up with a mathematically statistical, uh, very tricky transformation in which uh, um, he was able to convert total power of any process into its own power plus the influence it received, the causal power. And that lets 
um, you define the causal influence. For example, I'm looking at the X process, which we already um, mentioned. And if you could split its power into its own intrinsic power and the causal power, then the log of its total power, one power divided by intrinsic power defines the causal influence. If, if this power are the same, then this ratio is again, ratio is one, you have no influence. If the power, total power is more than the intrinsic power, uh, then you have causal influence. And that leads to higher value um, the causal influence. Uh, but again, you can go back to time domain if you integrate over the entire frequency range, um, half of the sampling rate actually um, from the measurements. And here is uh, based on the weakest definition that is the total log of total power, log of the ratio of the total power divided by the intrinsic power. Sorry, this script. Total minus intrinsic power. Notice that there are quantities here. Um, the sigma and h, those come from, sigma comes from this noise covariance, this matrix. And this h matrix comes from the, called the transfer function, comes from this, um, this a's, b's, and c's, all of those modeled together. So this parametric model automatically leads to this sigma and h. But in the um, non-parametric methods, you, you will have to construct the spectra and factorize that spectra from factorizations, which we came up with. You can derive transfer functions and uh, noise covariance matrix, which lets you calculate the grain's causality. And we have compared both parametric and non-parametric methods. Here I am uh, modeling a process uh, modeling a process X to do X1, um, uh, theoretically simulations. And I know the answer X2 influences X1. You get the answer that um, this X2 to X1 is non zero, 40 hertz, and the other way around is zero, both is parametric and non parametric methods. And this can be extended to not only the Fourier domain, the wavelet transform based, um, um, you know, looking at the time varying. Um, causal influence chains. And um, in that case, for example, x to the x1 influences only during the first half and the second half is zero, then you can capture that in the second plot here. So that's, that's the simulation. But comparing both parametric and non-parametric method, non-parametric methods, um, if you have underlying process complex, sometimes non-parametric method is better. It can capture the underlying process better here. We have modeled here two processes, y and x, y influences and x, y has a sinusoidal, exactly sinusoidal process, an autoregressive process, sinusoidal process are frequencies. I know exact frequency where the peaks should occur. And the non-parametric method captures those peaks, but the parametric method misses those peaks. And uh, this recent uh, parametric approach also cannot capture at uh, lower, um, lower uh, model order because in, in case of modeling the data, you have to truncate at some, some terms and that's, that, uh, that defines the model order. Um, and and um, you need arbitrarily very high to get a correct answer uh, to capture the spectral feature. But this parametric and non-parametric method can be complementary. And in neuroscience, this was introduced as uh, causal influence because there is, uh, there is no direct experimental technique to measure the influence from one brain reason to another brain reason. You have to resort to this type of technique, statistical technique of the, from, uh, derived from the data, time series data. You do not, you cannot measure directly, safely measure interactions, which is at the heart of understanding, uh, um, leading to a good understanding of how, how the brain works or how the process is happen in the brain. So the grain's causality was introduced for that reason, brain causality was introduced in 1999 and used in electrophysiological data, um, looking at the um, voltage electrical um, recordings. Um, and also the fMRI, the blood flow, sorry, um, blood flow, blood flow derived um, 
measurements. And our methods, that's, uh, and there is a competing, uh, competitive uh, method, another method is called the dynamical causal modeling method, was introduced in 2003. This, this uh, method has been used a lot. And our methods uh, was introduced in 2008, um, derived from Fourier and Weibler method. Um, and now we are looking at the non-parameter approach and um, this, in, uh, this paper with the Sydney group, where we're trying to look at the whole brain, how this, uh, you know, the transfer function based method, non-parameter method can be used to go from uh, relate structure to function. Uh, the functional uh, data, time series data, to structural the fiber tracks, how can you relate, derive, um, going back, um, back and forth. But that's ongoing work. So we have compare um, uh, brain causality and DCM to um, him is in the audience. He did this work with along with Sahil, um, with uh, Carl Friston, who was the inventor of this dynamical causal modeling. And we compared this method. We found out that this methods, at, at least for resting state fMRI, they are consistent. Um, the answers, they give the consistent answers. So these are the measures here from grains of causality methods between, um, between regions of the brain. Uh, fMRI data from 33, close to 30 subjects, 30 people, and uh, dynamical causal uh, modeling strengths that are highly correlated, consistent. So, so the time and so the greater causality method can infer delay. Now I'm going to talk about this is the last portion of the, um, the talk. I'm going to give you some example how this information can be used to understand um, different task related activities in the brain or brain organization during tasks and, and also disorders. Where well, those information, how that can be utilized to uh, to understand the propagations, um, activity propagations also how okay, can be utilized to for treatment. So um, as a result, uh, the title captures the results here that are, um, we um, were able to see two distinct frequency network in decision-making network, uh, decision-making processes. So the first task involves um, their um, just like a braille reading, right? The blind people read the um, braille um, can read easily. Trained uh, blind people, motivated motivated by that, we have this metal plates with bumps, three bumps, one bump in the middle not aligned along with the other two on the side. But there's the bump was very uh, tiny bump, so it's a 0.64 millimeter height. And it was offset to the, uh, you know, the other two, either to the left or to the right. And there's this uh, device here. This metal plate can be lifted up and down uh, uh, with the pressure automatically. And um, and the subject of the people, healthy people, were um, participating in an experiment. We had 15 participants, and the, um, we did each one of those um, uh, participants. Um, participant in the experiment, subject participant in the experiment more than 200 times. And what we did was we dropped this plate, blind, uh, they were blindfolded, uh, wore this easy cap, and we will simultaneously, we recorded this um, um, potential um, electrical activities from the scalp. So in the first second, we, uh, they fell these dots, three dots on the index finger, and the second seconds, after first second, that was lifted up. So in one hand, the right hand, they felt it and, and they had the mouse on their uh, left hand, the blindfolded people sat on a chair and um, the indicator was the, that the middle dot was, uh, whether that was on the left side or the right side. So this was the decision making task. So they, they felt this dot sensation that led to perception whether that dot was on the left side or the right side, and that led them to um, uh, decide whether that was on the right side or the left side, that was the perceptual decision. So there was attention involved, 
sensation leads to perception with, uh, with our uh, attentions and that can map onto actions, motor acts and so on. That's known as perceptual decision. Sorry, this is, um, now, and we wanted to understand how this signal is organized in the brain, different parts of the brain, frontal, somatosensory, parietal, and visual regions. So when you feel the dots, this goes from the hand to the finger, to the, through the spinal cord, to the thalamus, to the brain all over the brain. And how it's organized, it's what's the timing, uh, what's the frequency of oscillation that is organized and what binds together. And what, what found, we found out was, this is the electrode map, uh, electrode recordings, and one of the electrodes showed this. There is after 50 milliseconds when they felt the dot, in 50 milliseconds there was a peak, the average response peaked. And that mapped on the cortex, that's a, you can, like the, you know, the earthquake epicenter, you know, you felt the earthquake on the surface, and now you want to understand where it's coming from, the epicenter. Uh, you have to solve the inverse problem. Just like that, you are recorded on the scalp, you solve the inverse problem and find out for this um, activity, you find out where it falls, where it's originated, where it was the activity in the brain, on the cortex. So we found out that there's a somatic sensory region, um, which is exactly the right answer if they filled it up. And that gave us the confidence for the, the correct decision, which we looked at here, and during which the activity propagated to different, skip split inside. Um, activity propagated from somatosensory region to visual region, to the parietal, to the frontal. So I, I have different um, areas here. So it goes to different areas. The main point here I want to highlight is this, um, during this process, there is evolution of activity, peak activity going from somatosensory reason for uh, visual to parietal um, to uh, frontal. And that has, um, that has individual you know, um, significance um, at this region of the individual role. So you feel it, you visualize it, you associate it with the reason, right? So you make a decision, the frontal part, and they come together as a network, right? And to understand the network activity, what we did is a computationally intensive process that we calculated. We went and calculated the single trial that we, for each subject, 200 times the experiment was repeated because there is, it's, it's the nature of the brain experiment, always the brain experiment is repeated, same task is repeated over and over again to minimize, to reduce the variance of the, error, uh, variance of the noise. Uh, noise variance, um, and you have, um, we get to the single trial by inverse solutions modeling um, the sources as a dipole, the electrical dipole inside the brain, and then we found out single trials, and through the single trials, we calculated, we looked, we were able to look at the interactions, again, the, do a spectral analysis, look at the power, coherence, and range causality. Again, power tells you about the frequency of oscillations and individual reason. Coherence tells you about whether you have association or not at particular frequency. Grain's causality tells you the directed influence between reason. So what we observed was that there were two frequencies six, um, in the, um, around 16 hertz and 80 hertz. And all of those region power showed that coherence and causal influences showed this um, reason. Here I am showing you the parietal to dorsal uh, uh, prefrontal cortex. You have this blue high in the low, uh, low frequency, low in high frequency. The other way around, the influence of frontal to parietal is in high gamma. So the, there is a beta band, gamma band oscillations. So there was this. Um, and we did this analysis and looking at the peak activities. Um, how much time do I have? This is this. Uh, Maybe, uh, Ten minutes. Yeah, Ten minutes. Yeah, please. Okay. okay. All right. If you take more time, we'll have less time for questions. That's it. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I'm, I'm close to the end. I think. Um, 
Okay. I may have a lot of material that I talked too much. Uh, so um, coming to the summary of this, what we observed was that there were two frequencies. And the lower frequency, that's the beta hertz uh, oscillation, 12 to 30 hertz, 16, we observed 16 hertz. That exactly masked um, this causal influences what feed forward and mess with the evolutions of activity going from, uh, you know, from the lower order region, the somatosensory region to the peripheral cortex. And this um, high frequency oscillation was not in the feed forward fashion. This was, this was um, kind of a recurrent um, in a loop. So it involved frontal, parietal, frontal, parietal, and somatic three reasons only, frontal, parietal, and somatic sensory reason, not the visual one. And we thought that uh, one was relaying the information, carrying out the information, so there's a touch sensation through the brain. The other one is um, attention signal generated in the prefrontal cortex, uh, carrying out that. And, um, and we related to behavior when there, you know, there were experimenters repeated for each subject 200 times, and you can look at the, how they performed, whether they, were, they made a mistake. Um, for the correct decision, it was on the left side, the, the, whether they said it's left side or right side. And if you look the, uh, and calculate the behavioral performance in that way, and we calculated this coherence and going to causality and causal inference from parietal to frontal correlated with the behavior uh, more significantly. And there was also uh, in the beta band as well. And um, to, uh, the difference here between the correct and incorrect decisions of the responses, correct decisions showed you know, it's coherence chains between 120, roughly 120 milliseconds to 160 milliseconds, um, in which this uh, coherence got established, so they, they felt the dot and they, you know, the signal reached the right part of the brain and they realized, aha, this is correct, and this is on the left side or the right side. So that's how we resolved here you know, the timing of the, this process that way. And a similar experiment we, uh, we conducted, with the, that was the, uh, using the touch perception that the talk tactile stimulation now we have used the visual stimulations, people who are visual and auditory visual stimulation. There were four experiments. Uh, in all cases, we have decision-making tasks. People, um, you know, uh, their brain activity was recorded either in the scanner, MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging uh, machine, or they were e using EEG um, in face house case. And we showed them the picture um, clear picture, noisy picture in some cases, and the, this noise was created systematically from 0% clear faces, 40%, and 55%, and so on. So, uh, and and uh, I asked the questions at the end, each, each instance when it was presented, one instance you present a picture, you ask a question with, uh, you know, present for 500 milliseconds, then you ask questions um, after eight seconds, what was the picture? And they answer, and they move on to the next one. And you showed a picture of another, another, you know, either house or face, noisy cases. And so, um, another experiment we did was the auditory and visual stimulus, whether synchronous or not synchronous, right? So there was a delay of 100 milliseconds used between these two stimulus, beep and the flash on the screen and ask the subject to recognize those as simultaneous or not simultaneous. Synchronous or not synchronous, respond to those. And we showed them picture of happy and angry and asked them whether they saw noisy, happy or angry features in the, uh, in the stimulus. And we also did this experiment with the random dots. This experiment is a traditional experiment that had been performed um, with many, you know, many groups have done this uh, before. Uh, some of them are modified version of those. We asked them question whether they saw the, this dots were moving on the screen, portion of the dots would move to the left or to the right, and we asked them question whether they are move, uh, moving left or right. 
In all cases, we saw common reasons, and I, I don't want to get into the reason. These are derived from the blood flow oxygenation chains um, in the brain as measured by the NMR nuclear magnetic resonance imaging uh, method, looking at the blood flow and oxygenation chains, changes effect. And there are these reasons, the uh, primary sensory reasons, the primary uh, lower order reason, visual reason, face and house reasons, um, specific reasons, and task activating network is called the so-called salience network. Uh, salience network, and there is this uh, executive network, frontal network. So th there are common networks across all four tasks. That was, um, that was interesting. And this uh, face house experiment also, to summarize this is going without going into details, we performed a similar experiment and we observed there were this beta and gamma oscillations, uh, same frequency around 20 hertz and 80 hertz oscillations that was carrying out the decisions. Although the, the, the nature of this being, this being visual stimulus, this, the nature of feed forward and feedback was different, but um, we had this uh, frequency, same frequency. So we came to the conclusion that there, um, there was unified principles of network oscillations during perceptual decision making processes. And that was uh, 20 hertz and 80 hertz oscillations were carrying out this decision, which was consistent with um, you know, a studies that was done, um, published right before us uh, using different, uh, in different modalities. And um, this ongoing work, we are looking at uh, uh, using MRI techniques, we are looking at comparing video gamers and non-gamers, people who have played video games over time and people who didn't play video games and looking at how this exercise, they're playing video games, because when you play video games, it's like a mental exercise, a lot of exercise, you engage uh, you know, in multi-sensory perceptions. You are highly engaged and that enhance whether that does anything to the uh, perceptual ability and decision making. And we find out that um, the response time between video gamer and non-gamers, the response time is significantly different. Um, video gamers are much faster in responding to making decisions. For example, the moving dots, whether they're moving to the left or the right. And um, this was because of the instruction, there was not much difference between uh, accuracies. We asked them to perform the task as accurately as possible, as fast as possible. So, the you know, um, gamer were faster than the non-gamer, but the performance um, for different types of tasks, I didn't go into detail, but similar, um, not much different. Um, so there is this, this um, so this is ongoing work, but um, um, that was, that's, we're excited about this. So this is, we just finished collecting data and we're analyzing that uh, brain data. Um, here in the third aspect of the looking at the disorder, epileptic seizure, uh, we published two studies um, some time ago and um, how the delayed interactions would be useful in this, this case, epileptic seizure to um, in epilepsy surgery to help neurosurgeon to treat uh, patient. So as you know, that's a, more than 50 million people worldwide suffer from epileptic, epileptic human epilepsy. 30% of those suffer from severe epilepsy that they don't respond to drugs, um, the medicines, and the only hope for treatment is surgery. And surgery fails about 40% of the cases. It's imperfect, um, one reason being this, the idea of the, um, you know, in surgery, you go in and find out the monitor through electrophysiological recording, you monitor the brain activity and find out where the seeds are originate and you try to extract or reset those regions, remove that region. And that is an imperfect process. Um, so we wanted to um, see whether we can contribute there. So this is the typical recordings of, for example, there's a patch, uh, the electrodes in the patients implanted inside and recordings so more than 200 electrodes there in recordings. And the patients um, get into Caesar at some point and all of the electrodes recording shows abnormal type of activities. 
we wanted to understand if there is anywhere before that happens, we can detect it earlier, whether this uh, delayed interactions that cause an influence can help us identify the onset of season. And that's what exactly we did. And we found out that, that the causal influence is actually the um, outflow looking at, for example, there are three reasons, three electrodes. We are looking at um, A and look, um, calculating the um, causal inference going from A and what comes to A. And if you add all comes in going from A and what comes to A, and you do outflow minus inflow, that gives you net outflow. And the net outflow jump to higher than the noisy threshold much earlier. In some patients, we saw that it, it jumped to higher than the earlier at just um, high, at high frequency, and almost more than 40 seconds earlier here. Um, and uh, using this method, we were able to identify in uh, about a dozen subjects that's high frequency network activity, looking at the frequency activity more than 50 hertz, you can identify localized Caesar better uh, than just by the visual inflection. That's what the, usually the neurosurgeon uh, the um, doctors do um, in the monitoring. Units. And this was uh, one case where they had this um, uh, inconsistent uh, recordings um, uh, activities where um, the electrode A and B and C here regions were showing high frequency discharges and they were confused what reason to resect. The doctors would not like to resect both reasons at the same time because of the functions, uh, the patient will suffer the functional deficit and they you know, traditionally they like to resect the uh, temporal lobe, and we found out that from our methods that the occipital reasons, this reasons, was not the leader. Um, this um, this was this was the leader, so they didn't have to worry about the occipital reason. So that that's a couple of patients we have looked at, um, you know, before their surgery and help them um, treat them. So they, uh, this patient becomes seizure free and was back at work after a year. And there was another patient. And uh, right now, I, I, I don't have much time. I, I don't want to get into details. We, uh, this patient gave us the opportunities over here, which, uh, which, had, which had a known, um, you know, the seizure with the start when the tummy started tingling and the stingling sensations with marks from the hand to the face and twitching of the face. And we knew that uh, because of this behavior, the uh, seizure would start from the somatosensory regions. This is the perfect case to, uh, um, to check out the Granger causality method. And uh, in three episodes of seizure, we found out that there was a high frequency activity exactly consistent where the seizure would originate a start. And this patient was treated um, by um, responsive of uh, the neurostimulator rather than the surgery because of the functional uh, fear of the functional deficit that the, the patient would lose if they, uh, you know, reset this reason. And uh, recently we are looking at this now going back to this blood flow dependent measure, blood flow related measure, the uh, functional MRI measure which all of this measure, this um, EEG, uh, the intercortical EEG, uh, the invasive measure, you have to open up the skull and record all this, uh, for this patient that uh, you have to inject um, electrodes inside, number of electrodes inside and identify where the seizure is coming from, monitor where the seizure is coming from. We, what we wanted to understand is that non-invasive recordings like MRI recordings, where the resting state MRI recordings would be able to localize Caesar. And for this patient, we have both easy recordings, intercortical easy recordings, in this case, stereotactic easy needle implanted inside, and uh, also resting state fMRI recordings. And the likely target is the singular region here, the red mark here. 
and um, there is a slow oscillation. So we want to relate the slow oscillation interest uh, that, because the slow oscillation you observe only in this blood related measurements, the blood flow related measurements. We wanted to understand non invasively recorded uh, recordings, slow oscillation, whether slow oscillation helps to identify localized seizure. And um, what we find out that uh, from this slow oscillations from this stereotactic EEG matches to the high frequency and this uh, between the centrality, what, uh, what uh, node or uh, what area comes in between, that also shows, highlights those reasons are the important reasons for seizure propagation. And um, this is a recent work. Um, Sushma is doing this work recently and we're very excited about this work that C finds out from the fMRI recording that the resting state fMRI recordings, those likely targets pop, uh, you know, automatically come up in, with uh, grains of causality uh, uh, delayed interaction measures. And um, so that was, that's, this is, this, and we're looking at the whole brain, whether these are looking at, uh, we looked at now, we looked at the context of those um, regions of those contacts of the electrodes, those electrodes here inside those electrodes. And now we're looking at the whole brain. We go in the whole brain of patients and whether we can, from the invasive and non-invasive organ, whether we can identify localized seizure by this method. So that's ongoing work. And uh, now coming to the conclusion summary. Uh, so the time delay coupling um, in uh, neurons are the uh, neural are other oscillators, couple oscillators can um, induce different effects. One is the synchrony enhancement. There is phase flip um, transitions, which I didn't talk about. Uh, it can lead to period different coherent states and multi-stable patterns, amplitude death, which I didn't talk about, but we have done some work on that. And the combined positive and negative coupling can extend the, um, you know, delay can extend um, reasons, parameter space plus synchronization. And in case of uh, time weighted couplings, there is a one, you know, the forward, only the time delay can change the critical coupling strength in one direction, four directions. And the Granger causality is useful to infer a test hypothesis about uh, information flow uh, from time series data. And there are two important results. The perceptual decision-making process, you have specific network frequency, 20 hertz, 80 hertz oscillations that carry out decisions, epileptic seizure. There's uh, more than 50 hertz oscillations, uh, more than 80 hertz oscillations. It's helpful in localizing seizure that translates of that, that, is, uh, that can co-occur with the infrasolar frequency in both uh, measurements that are the um, student, uh, previous student, postdoc, there are different places now um, who contributed to the work, collaborators, and funding. And thank you for your attention. I think I, I, I took all the time. Thank you. Uh, so, um, is there time for questions? Or, uh, sir, could you please? Uh, take a few questions. Probably there is a there are a few questions in the chat box, right, sir? Yes, yes, uh, I, I can see them. Okay. Uh, and so on. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mukesh Damla, once again for this uh, nice and uh, very interesting presentation. And mostly for our students, uh, new students, they now know where physics can be used in biophysics as well. I mean, to this depth, of course, they knew it. So because we have less time. I request uh, the participant to be as brief as possible and not to repeat. I have a question chat and I have a question in the First, Isur Prasad Koirala. I have a question in the chat, but I ask you to be brief, please. Unmute yourself. Isur Ji, Ununcha? Probably. Okay. Wow. 
ओके अर्क नेक्स्ट महादुर कार्की सर रिक्वेस्ट कर स्वास्थ्य मंत्रालय अंतर्गत खोल तेमोरियल लस को बारे में अर्सेपल डिशीजन को बारे में न्यूरोफिजिक्स को बारे में धेरे बताने भो अभी मैं अलग के चिंता भैर अब अभी मेरे डिमेन्सिया अलग बढ़े गए हाई अभी इसको बारे में अलग ये हम अब यो अब यो इवरी थ्री सैकेंड्स समोन इन द वर्ल्ड डेवलप्स डिमेन्सिया भाई है इट बिके इट बी बिकेम ट्रिलियन डलर्स डिजिज भाई डिमेन्सिया अब यह कसरी हमें हम गमेंट अथवा हम जनता थर्टी and there are people who work in animal model they induce uh, you know this type of alzheimer disease type of um, you know disease conditions in animals rats uh, mouse and study those animals and look at the exactly what happens right so what can what type of changes from um, molecular level to the system level circuit level and then people are studying humans um, also uh, with humans there are this neuroimaging method right so uh, some of them i i talked about um i i haven't done um, research directly into alzheimer disease but this is related so i i i mentioned this uh, time delay change the change in time delay of uh, uh, transmissions of uh, single transmission single propagation from one region of the brain to another region can change with the alzheimer disease and that can be a biomarker right so this this can be uh, one can calculate this time delay or look at the axonal tracks um, and what is stays a person is um, through the activity the structure and functional recordings both and whether um um any interventions of uh, medical intervention needed to uh, slow down this progression um there are many active groups in uh, how to help nepal in this regard um uh, theoretical research can be done I, in terms of the research that i uh, that i can think of uh, I, i don't have any other um other um thought about um, how you one can help but uh, in terms of research you can definitely collaborate people the student can collaborate and faculty member can collaborate with different groups um, and data is available these days freely available you just have to download and analyze um, experimental data and you can develop your own model based you know based on the collaborations uh, inputs and so on thank you uh, karki sir uh, next uh, next i request dibakar sigdel please dibakar uh dibakar are you there uh yes um okay, tamala sir right. thank you uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk uh i'm a little bit curious about uh, the role this delay plays in the um, fundamental functional structure of the human brain itself um so the delay of the, the delay is there right so the delay is, I, i i i talk about this delay is there because of the physiology right so you have uh, it's not a, like nerve impulses traveling from one neuron to another neuron 
the length of uh, length of axons, the diameter of axons, and so on. That that leads to uh, significant delay. And delay delay could be small. And we have to talk about the time period of oscillations, right? Network oscillations, the oscillations. Um, if the oscillations is slow, the delay. You know, if the delay is small, you can ignore it. But the oscillations is uh, faster, and a small delay can be significant comparable comparable to. Um, comparable to the um, oscillations. So because of this especially distributed um, populations of neurons and their interactions, delay is inherent, delay is there. That's the structure. So, and that comes from the, this, uh, the solitary conductions of nerve impulses along the axons, axonal tracks. I don't know whether I, I answer a question or... Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, sir. Um, my concern is because of this delay, is this causing the different part of the human brain to localize for the specific task? For example, the sound is processed in a specific region, the test is processed in a specific region, uh, the neuron communicate locally, and then they also communicate to the different different part uh, separately. So, is the delay the fundamental reason for this different type of local and global communication in the human uh, brain? There are um, sensory specific reasons, right? The sensory, specific, for example, uh, we have the auditory cortex. Is it known as the auditory cortex because the auditory information is processed in that part of the brain in majority. But it, it um, you know, the, to process that information, it, um, the activity is coordinated with other regions also. So there are the special uh, sensory, uh, sensory specific reasons. But, um, and, and the, this, um, this, um, the sensory information processing um, are, are, are your questions about there are um, um, this uh, the auditory, visual, other information, how this gets processed or how this information is separated based on delay. It's not only delay, delay is there inherent, but there are a specialized reason for processing of sensor, different sensory information. So mm -hmm. different reasons have different paths, but they can come together, right? So um, there are unisensory reasons, there are multisensory reasons, that the whole brain is sort of multisensory in a sense that, you know, the auditory reason was thought as a specialized in the auditory reasons, and it turns out that it can process the visual information also. So, but the delay is inherent. There is, you know, it takes time for signal to go from one reason to another reason. And, and this delay can change when child grows, right? So their myelination, this myelination sheet that the fat around the axon can populate and become um, stronger, or the um, layer can become thicker and thicker, and then um, uh, this delay reduces. And as the person grows older, then there may be thinning uh, uh, with the disorder, there may be thinning and the delay becomes larger. In the case of ALS, you lose myelination and the, this uh, uh, conduction becomes uh, inefficient. And you, uh, the person gets you know, uh, mm -hmm. paralyzed. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Damala, once again. And uh, there were many more questions which are answered. I mean, I, there are still some, like uh, Ravina Kaderia, she was talking about delayed interaction, and Devendra Rajupadhyay, someone by the name iPhone 9S Plus uh, about uh, work. So now I go back to, if, if you people have still query or not answered, just raise your hands. Uh, Susil Pangani, please go ahead. Are you there, Susil? Seal. Okay, um, maybe he. Yes, sir. No? Yes, sir. Okay, please I go mean, ahead. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Tomala, for the wonderful presentation. I am from Wayne State University, Detroit, Michigan. Are you my question is, my question is, 
first of all about the diffusion MRI and FRF MRI. How mm -hmm. imaging information pattern vary in that D diffusion MRI you mentioned and the functional MRI? The first question. Second question, what degree of brain information do you mimic in your computational calculation? I see some of the equation that has A, B, C, something. What does, what do they represent? And the last one, yeah, this is exciting one about the video game. What kind of video game experiment do you are doing to see the activity and you are inferring that video game influences the brain activity? Thank you. Well, there are many questions. Let me go back to the first question. Uh, shall I answer the last question? So let me ask the uh, answer the last question and you can repeat the other question. Okay, the last question is what kind of experiment we are doing with the video game, right? So yes. uh, the person sits, um, so these are two group of um, individuals, right? So one group, they have experience of playing video games for more than five years. Other group, they didn't play video games, just like me, right? So the other group, just like my son, who plays video games all the time. Um, so, and, and you, um, so they come to, um, come to the lab, and we, in the lab, we have this um, screen set up and they were um, not where in this case, uh, it's, uh, the fMRI experiment that we are doing. We plan to do easy experiment also. So they go into the MRI machine and we record their blood oxygenation change while they do their decision-making task. So the decision-making task, they look at, the, uh, look at the screen and we show them this dots form of dots, sometimes they move on the left, uh, you know, towards the left of the screen or to the right of the screen. And there are, um, you know, there are two color dots, one uh, on top of each other to, to create the motion, that type of motion that we have um, created. I, I don't have that um, exact stimulus here. And it, depending on the color contrast, you may be able to see easily going left or right, or we may not be able to see that. Sometimes the, the task becomes difficult. Although I didn't explain the task in, in detail, but the swarm you, person, look at the screen, and we show them the dots, two color dots, one moving on top of the other, either left or the right. And depending on the color contrast, depending on the speed, uh, this can be difficult task. And we change the difficulty level and ask them to uh, decide whether that's going to the left or right. And we, it turns out that the video gamers are fast, right? so almost 100 milliseconds faster than the non-gamer to, um, to decide whether that, um, you know, which way the dots are going. And we haven't, we haven't completely looked at their brain activity. So we just finished collecting data uh, from 58 subjects total, uh, close to 58, I think, um, before this um, lockdown happened. And then we were waiting to collect some more. That's, um, that's, I don't know when that's going to happen. So that's ongoing study. In front of, and your question about, I think I answered that question, uh, right? The, the video game. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, you yes, have, you did. Yeah. Um, you had a question about uh, oh, the diffusion MRI, MRI. The function. Uh, uh, diffusion MRI and the function MRI, what they, what they represent, I think. Uh, is that right? Or what's the difference, right? Can you, can you, um, yeah. I, I forgot. Yes, I, I he was, was, yeah, yeah, that was the question. Okay. So the functional MRI, the functional MRI, uh, it's like taking a picture of a person, right? So you're looking at, a, looking at the brain, you take a picture every two seconds. Uh, here in this case, every 750 milliseconds, less than a second, you take a picture over a period of time. And then you follow each pixel in the brain, how volumetric pixel, how, how the intensity changes over time. And that intensity comes from looking at the um, looking at the blood oxygenation chains. So whenever there is a neuronal activity in the brain, that leads to oxygen chain, the oxygenation chain, the blood flow chain in the region. That associated with the uh, neuronal activity, of course, is fast, but the blood flow to the region is slower. Uh, uh, 
electrical activity is in milliseconds, right? It's not uh, 100 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds or so. But um, um, block flow time scale is second in seconds. So when you present something, task, right, the stimulus, visual stimulus, the peak occurs at four or five seconds later. Whereas the, you know, the neural activity happens within 50 milliseconds, okay, in the, in the brain, in the visual cortex. So the fMRI records the blood flow oxygenation change, effect of blood flow oxygenation change in the nuclear magnetic resonance properties of hydrogen nuclei, okay? So the blood flow and oxygen change, and that leads to different um, the resonance. And that is reflected in this in images we collect in the fMRI. That's called the functional magnetic resonance imaging. So you take every two seconds, you take images. Awesome. Um, so that's, uh, I, I say it, uh, fMRI bold, right? The blood oxygen level dependent signal. That's the fMRI depends on. Whereas the diffusion MRI depends on looking at the water diffusion across the brain. So you, um, again, this, the, the, this depends on the protocols, the M NMR protocols, MRI protocols, the gradient pulses, how you use the gradient uh, pulse sequence. And when you use a correct gradient pulse sequences, you can um, look at the spin, um, movement of spin, so the high kilometers of the water molecules over the brain. And that water molecules over the brain is asymmetric uh, along the fibers, right? So you're looking at if it's in the cerebrospinal fluid, it's, uh, it goes in symmetric fashion everywhere, right? So all directions, but along the fiber is restricted. So you track the you track the flow diffusion. This diffusion tensor or the diffusion diffusion look at in the diffusion images, diffusion along the fiber of water molecules. Then you can track that pathways. So that and that reflects the white matter tracks. So diffusion images based on the uh, diffusion of water molecules, whereas fMRI is based on the blood oxygen level dependent signal. We have a third, uh, third question I forgot the third question. No, that, uh, that was video game. You answered already, I, I suppose. Um, so, of course, there are many uh, more raised hands uh, because Om sir was saying privately to me long back. So, Om sir, are you there? Please go ahead. Hello? Can you hear or can you? Okay. Um, before he's ready, I don't know who is Oppo. I am sorry. Uh, or at least I go to uh, Kamal. Oh, he raised the hand down. Kamal Dakal, please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Can I ask? Uh, who, who is it now? I'm Om. Oh, please, please. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Too I'm many people. Sir. So, Om, Om, yeah. sir. Or I don't know. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Raj, sir, and Bill, sir, for. For this talk and thank you Mukesh sir for presenting my talk. Uh, I have one question to Mukesh sir like you showed one graph that describes the relationship between this delay and the age of people. Can you go back to that slide? Which one? Uh, age? Age and the delay I guess. It's about in the, at the beginning I think. Um, where was the A's and the delay? Uh, okay, next, next one. This, uh, next, this, one. Uh, next one. Next uh, is where's the no can uh, back? Isn't this the one? Uh, which one? The third? You mean third one? Yeah, the the blue one. Uh, the blue, the last, you mean the last one. The uh, last one sort of, sort of tells you what, ha what will happen, but it's not related. I don't have that plot here. Okay, so then I'm sorry. Like, do you have any, any no. study over that? Like how the delay and the age of the people uh, are related? Right. 
So if the, it depends, the whole thing depends on the myelination, right? The myelination meaning this, this fat, fatty materials of the myelin seed on the axons, how it changes over age. As a person ages, how it changes. Or um, any sort of neurodegeneration, or, or an, even in normal aging, what happens to the diameter of axons, whether you lose connections, or um, you lose volume of axonal tracts, or this myelin seed you lose. Uh, depending on that, that's the conduction delay will change. So the conduction becomes inefficient when you don't have insulation around. Conduction becomes inefficient, our, our um, delay becomes longer when it shrinks, the di diameter becomes smaller. Just like the wire, right? So that the current flow, you know, the bigger ones, it's uh, easier than the smaller ones. Uh, so that there is no any specific relationship, right? Because you may have like these things uh, changes during any age, maybe in the childhood or in the mid adult. Yeah, definitely, for, definitely for child, child, you know, the child grows, the neurodevelopment, development, there is the myelination and delay changes. And you can probe through this EEG measurements and right, looking at the alpha when you close your eyes in the dark and um, monitor the, the back part of the brain, back part of the head, put an electrode there with respect to your lobe or something, and then you'll see 10 hertz oscillations, right? So adult, as an adult, close mm -hmm. to 10 hertz. Um, uh, the child, that 10 hertz um, oscillations occurs when the child is growing, that's the delay is longer. Um, so this become, frequency becomes slower at a lower frequency. Okay. And, um, um, and, and older age person, and there are studies, some studies I have seen recently, uh, uh, with aging also this, um, this frequency shifts to lower frequency. 10 hertz becomes 7 hertz or so, it goes down. So you can, definitely it's overall delay, the global delay reduces and you can imagine that if something happens between motor and some other reasons, then the motor processes become, uh, motor activity becomes inefficient or, or uh, difficult. Or uh, it happens in the visual, um, visual um, areas with other reasons that may become, become affected. Things like that. So can we, can we summarize that like to some extent, since this delay is a natural, thing in human being or human brain. Can you summarize that? Yes, the delay is inherent, it's there, but it changes over time, over, over, over different age and different conditions. Delay is there, it's inherent because of the specially distributed, that's um, because of the axonal tracks, right? The axons, how, it is, how the impulses propagate. So unlike the, you know, the uh, passive transmission of electricity through the wires, now that you, you flick a switch here, you, you, um, or if, you know, somebody flicks a switch at the, at the source, your line can be cut off. The electricity can go um, turned off far away from, from your location, but, but instantaneously. But that doesn't happen in the brain. There's active transmissions that each, each node have to participate in, um, in transmitting that signal impulses. Uh, sorry, uh, I, I'm sorry. We have to wrap up very quickly and because two more reins hands. Kamal Dakal, please go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, yeah, okay. Sir, uh, namaste. I have a comment. I have a comment. I have a comment. I have a comment. I I Biology and anatomy, physiology, just not in a sorry high level could talk in or I mean, very biophysics, your data science to come very soon, your biophysics, there any booming side So Amru Mukisali Moiliki, Amru, opportunities of Molly come very as we get a passal person the key. Only you, vision restorers, blind like Cossary Distorgani, on the Lacossary, the Hinibani on your projects. Parker, I'm listening up to genetics on you, news of the Wabinia, Josila Tau, uh, you know, I like sorry, the whole work to accent potential man, perhaps a neuron or lazy ion channel, but a cam garden, 
यदि कुछ कारण आयन चालने काम करेन तो एटा भर्खर अलग न्यूरो साइंस में टेक्नोलॉजी डेवलप भाष अप्रो जेनेटिक्स जहाँ ये प्लांट में पाइने एवं प्रोटीन लिया एक्सप्रेस कर लाइटली स्टिमुलेसन कर काम कर मुख्य काम चाहिए यो फोटो रिसेप्टर में चाहिए भग अजन रिस्टोरेशन में भिजुअल न्यूरो साइंस में फोटो रिसेप्टर ने लाइट इलेक्ट्रिकल सीग्नल में कन्वर्ट कर दिवाले मोस्ट अफ द ब्लाइंडनेस चाहे जन्मजात अंधो भाग रोग ला अंधो होने मानेह को संख्या धेरे तो अपर्चुनिटीज मेथड अल परमिशिंग आँखा में यदि तो प्रोटीन एक्सप्रेसन गयो मं अंधो भाई लाइट स्टिमुलेट कर इलेक्ट्रिकल सीग्नल दिने भर तो ब्रेनसम गए मानी फिर देखने सकता भी ओहो रखर हमें तो मंकी में एक्सपेरिमेंट भर्खर तो नेचर में पब्लिकेशन कर अगड़ी को महीना सर प्रोटीन हो बाजार को आँखा में हालां रखे एक्शन पोटेन्सिंग देखा गैंगलिन सेल हमें एक्शन पोटेन्सिंग मेजर ग्यौंस को अर्थ तो रेटिना ने काम करो भाई भो तर अब ब्रेन में जाना खेल तब अप्टिक डिश बा अब तो अप्टिकल काज में गए क्रस हो हम अप्टिकल न्यूरोन अप्टिक नशा है दृष्टि नशा ते पड़ी अभी तब देखा अक्किपिटल में घर ठैक्क आदि भाग यता आदि भाग यता जोड़ी हम टाउका को पाड़ीपटी हो तेस में अ खास काम कर अर्खर जो भगवे बाँदर में सक्सेस भाग ह्यूमन ट्रायल करते दुई तीन टाइम कंपनी ने अब तर आई एम अल्सो वर्किंग राइट न विथ ह्यूमन ट्रायल क्लिनिकल ट्रायल दैट इज नट दैट मच एक्साइटिंग डेटा एज आई वॉज एक्सपेक्टिंग क्योंकि मैं सोचे थे अब मैं मंकी में गए देखा थे एकदम अब अंदा देखो मैं हमें रमाइल भाई थी तर क्लिनिकल डेटा में जाना तीत पोजिटिव देखिया है तब तीन मैं देखा के ला तुम्हारा फर्मुला लिखा थे एसोसिएसन अथवा इंटर डिपेन्सी वन माइनस लग वन माइनस को अरेस्ट होना यदि तो अरेस्ट भैन तो इंटर डिपेन्डेन्सी भैन अला कता कता लगे यदि तो अब एकचि ब्लाइंड भैस को मानक को भिजुअल पास होता डिस्टर्ब भर तो गैंगलिन सेल में एक्शन पोटेन्सि भाई मानी ने नदेखना को कारण कत एसोसिएसन नबर हो कि जो तक आइडिया With the optogenetics tool, also you can stimulate the visual visual from the um, the ganglion cells, you know. Yeah, I mean, from the optogenetics, people are doing a lot of in the neuroscience. They are trying to do treat different diseases by direct stimulation of uh, neurons in the brain, yeah. right? But yeah. what I'm working is in use that optogenetics to the retina, so that these photoreceptor can uh, restore their so, function. So, let me ask you this: So you have.